So this is Lupkow Pass, the first of six maps to be revealed for the In the Name of the Tsar DLC. And first things first, a big announcement. This map alone has been moved up to an August release. It seems DICE has listened to the community and decided that September was too long to wait, and they bumped this map forward by 30 days. That means we now have a steady flow of content all the way through to the full release of the DLC in September. Well played, DICE. Now, onto the map itself. Lupkow Pass is a large, undulating map focusing on infantry and air combat. A very interesting combination. The only ground vehicle that you'll find here on this map at the moment is the Armoured Train Behemoth, and that rolls in in its snow clothing during rounds of Conquest. It's worth noting, I've only played the map on Conquest, but it will support multiple other game modes from release, including the brand new game mode for the DLC called Supply Drop. The map offers a landscape that's based off of the real Lupkow Pass in the Carpathian Mountains. This rail route kept the Austro-Hungarian Empire linked between Galicia and the rest of Central Europe. The train track on the map splits it right across the middle, with the train being able to influence two flags, E and F. The map itself is fairly large, with a big distance between the two armies' HQs, but the gameplay, as with most maps, filters around the middle objectives. There are four here that really held most of the gameplay. These flags are all relatively close together. You'll find the majority of infantry fighting in this location, trying to hold a majority, and they're within easy running distance of each other. You can actually run in a nice loop if you want to, but I found it was better to run across the circle. You get plenty of clashes of players, and that's perfect to try out some of the new weapons. Now, if you watched my video last week, you'll know that there are 11 distinct weapons coming with the In the Name of the Tsar DLC, but only six of them were present in this build so far. It is still an unfinished build of the game. So for the Assault class, we had the 1900 double barrel shotgun. For the Medic, we had the Fedorov Avtomat. The Support had the MG14 Parabellum. For the Scout, the Mosin Nagan M91. For the Tanker and Pilot classes, we had the Suppressed Carbine C93, and the sidearm for all classes, the Nagant Revolver. Now I've got footage of most of them here, but having only spent about three hours with the new map and the content, I've only got some basic impressions for you, so don't expect some really in-depth details here. First up, the double barrel shotgun. It's a beast. It comes in two different variants. We've got the factory and the slug. And as the name suggests, you've got two shells to fire before reloading it. You can double tap the fire button insanely fast and pop those rounds off into an enemy for massive damage effect, or at least on the factory variant, you can actually switch the fire mode and you can offload both rounds at once. A true double damage shot. Now the slug is much better for long range, but again, be aware that after two shots, you're going to have to go through a fairly lengthy reload process. Next up, the Fedorov Avtomat, a fully automatic rifle for the Medic class. It's got a slow fire rate and some fairly bouncy recoil, and that makes it harder to use at long range, but it excels at medium range, which in my opinion was perfect for the Lupkow Pass map. This was probably my favourite weapon of the lot. There are two variants available, the Trench for good hipfire capabilities in close quarters, or the Optical if you want a little bit more help at longer ranges. Then we've got the MG14 Parabellum, it's really really good and it has a really funky reload animation as well, it looks really cool but takes a long time. A fast fire rate makes it a good option for competing with SMGs and shotguns in close quarters, and it appears to have a good bullet velocity as well. I spent plenty of time damaging the planes in the sky as they flew past with this one. And as with all LMGs, it gets more accurate the longer you sustain your fire, but the initial recoil kick is pretty severe. Weapon number four is the Mosin Nagant rifle, that slots into the Scout class quite nicely, and it appears to offer players something similar to a Lee Enfield style loadout. 
It comes with a five round internal magazine in a factory and marksman variant. So the maximum scope power you get is four times. And this makes it a bit more aggressive than some of the other heavier bolt action rifles, but it appears to lack some of the benefits of the Lee Enfield, like that close range sweet spot and the 10 round internal magazine. One thing I did notice with the Nagant is when you reload it, if there's still bullets left in the internal magazine, the soldier will reload it with a stripper clip, but it will only push so many in, and then it will flick the rest of the bullets up and away from the gun. So it's not a single bullet reload each time, you'll still reload it with a stripper clip, but a certain amount of bullets will get flicked away. So that's props to the animation team over at DICE for creating something really cool there. The Nagant Revolver is a handy little sidearm. You've got seven rounds to fire, and it pops those off pretty quickly. But like its bolt-action rifle namesake, the reloading can be a little bit of a chore, but you can get a second reload option as well. Now, if there are bullets left in the weapon, each round will be reloaded individually. But if there are no bullets left, your soldier will take the cylinder out of the revolver and replace it with a brand new one. So yet again, props to the DICE animation team for creating another cool weapon animation. And lastly, the suppressed C93 carbine. I didn't get any footage of it. I don't fly planes and that's the only way to get it on this map because there are no land vehicles for you to be the tanker. You can only get it as a pilot. But from what Jack Frag said to me though, apparently it's a bit of a pea shooter. Now, as I've mentioned, that's just six weapons, and there are 11 in total coming to this DLC, so we're missing another five there. And there were no new gadgets in this build, although none have actually been announced for this DLC. The Russian Standard Grenade wasn't in there, the Muromets Bomber was missing, the Putilov Garford Truck was absent too, and there were no new weapon skins either. So it's pretty clear this DLC is still a work in progress, but the Lupkal Pass map almost certainly was in its final stages of production. The outer capture points are far more isolated, but they are dense with trees and soft cover. So despite being a fairly large map overall, each of the capture points was very well implemented and surrounded to make the whole location feel a lot tighter. The central points where the main action happened to be in our capture sessions was the C flag, the D flag and the F flag. The C and D flag sit much higher up above the train track and the F point is almost level with the train track. But there are natural pathways between all three and you can sort of loop your way around them a little bit. C and D had this very natural link, it was almost a direct route between the two, and it felt like it was almost designed to be the focal point of the entire map, despite them being the blandest capture points in the entire map anyway. B and E, those two flags, they incorporate small buildings and a freezing river, offering lots of little hiding spots, and the G flag, right up near the Russian headquarters, is a dilapidated castle, and it's got multiple levels around it offering some tight gameplay opportunities. If I bring up the map overview again though, you can see here we have a total of seven flags on the map, and that's an odd number. This means one team will always be gaining score faster than the other, and that makes holding on to those two central flags, C and D, all the more important. They are the pivot point of the entire round, basically, and they can only be captured by infantry standing on them. Remember, no ground vehicles to bolster your presence here. The planes can have some influence here, of course, because the bomber can strafe down, drop some pain on enemy players' heads, and the fighters can come in with their darts, but overall, it's down for the infantry to get the job done. And just very briefly, I want to talk about the cavalry class. There's a big presence of it here on Lupkow Pass. DICE is currently working hard to improve the handling and the overall experience of the cavalry class in the game, and I think it's very clear to see why once you play this map. There are so many cavalry classes here on just Lupkow Pass, my guess is they will be a bigger gameplay focus across the entire Russian DLC. The new Cavalry Lance has an awesome animation where you can skewer kebab enemies, but there's still some room for improvement. The map features a lot of small objects, a lot of low cover, and sometimes the horse struggles to get over something that really should be quite easy. 
But DICE have still got two months in to nail those changes. Expect a lot more cavalry charges in this upcoming DLC. Overall, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Even though I played the map for three hours, uh, Loop Cow Pass is probably one of the best maps that you can play in Battlefield 1 right now, and I cannot wait for you guys to get your hands on it. There's still a long way to go with this DLC, and still so much more content that hasn't been revealed yet. Let me know what you think of this first look down below in the comments. As I'm sure you can tell, I'm pretty excited, and we've still got two months to go before the release. I'll be reading as many comments as I can, as I always do. But until next time, my name is Westy, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.